I was just there and I share planet Earth with that. And, and that, so that was a very extreme experience. So was Afghanistan, because you, you used to see the history of the Soviet-Afghan war everywhere. Kids playing on blowed up tanks and landmines still everywhere. And a lot of work and so on. Um, so we were talking backstage and uh, you said that really good news. You said the day you start thinking uh, it's what you deserve is the day you deserve to get your ass kicked. Yeah. <laughs> Talk, to, talk a little bit about what that means for you in terms of like, because you, so, you, you do so many things and you are in this constant state of motion. Is that part of what drives you? Is it feeling like, it's like if I have this opportunity, I have to take it? Yes. I'm driven primarily by two things, anger and curiosity. And I'm not angry at you, quite the opposite. <laughs> I'm just angry at everything else. And, and it makes me curious. And the curiosity fuels the anger. Because I'm sure all of you are pretty switched on. Things make you mad. You see people getting the short end of some stick somewhere. You're like, that's not right. And you get mad about it if you have half an idea. And so that makes me want to go do stuff and live vigorously. Um, but I have learned, I'm 54, I'm an eternal uh, gratitude machine. Because the only reason I get to do anything is because I have an audience. And they can... I need them more than they need me, and they'll be done with me well before I'm done with them, which sucks, because I'm never going to be done with them, ever. If I had you for the next five hours, I'd wear you out, <laughs> just telling you stuff. But you'll be done with me before I'm done with you, and that's okay. I don't like that deal, but that is the deal. And so the only reason I get to do it, I'm the tree that falls in the forest unheard and unwitnessed unless I have an audience. And so without them, I got no plans. And so you have to say thank you a lot because everyone is giving you time they can't get back. That's why I don't try and waste anyone's time. That's what makes it. It's turned me into kind of a maniac. Because you don't, want to, you, you don't want to disappoint anyone. You don't want to let anyone down. And that's why I talk too long in answers. <laughs> that's the answer. And like, would you sign this? <laughs> Just because they care. And so... As an, as an older person, you go, damn, man, people are really cool, even the ones who write your letters stay out of Texas, which you can't. <laughs> it's a big state, so I can hide it. <laughs> but you must, if you ever think you're, punk rock taught me you're not owed anything. Because in those days, the early punk rock is you could walk through your audience who paid $6.50 to throw beer cans at your head. And they, no one wanted to meet you. And someone come like, I suppose you think you know, I want to meet you because you're in a band. You're like, no, but there's an insult coming somewhere. <laughs> Wait for it. Well, I don't want to meet you because you're in a band. <laughs> okay, thanks. I got to load the gear up now. And so I kind of come from that. So anytime anyone wants to meet me, I'm like, really? Well, damn. And so all of that has, uh, it's, it's a very forceful propellant. It seems like you've also, though, you, in terms of like, okay, you, you, know, you need the, you need your audience more than they need you. You've also really diversified your audience. I mean, it's like I was, when we were backstage, there was a guy who came up from, um, he was a librarian. Yeah. It says, and was um, thanking you for the support you gave me. Because you were the keynote for the National College and Research Librarians Association. Yeah. I mean, that's not, that's not an association I would have made, but it's like, that seems like, because you were saying, it's like you have like this massive archive of everything. Of, I keep a lot of records, records and, yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of records and books and literature and correspondence, a lot of paper, paper, not. So, I mean, it's like, is that part of also what drives you? Is like trying to find fresh audiences, find you know, you know, other you know, other people to connect with. Yeah, and just things to do. In the summer of 1984, I was 23, and most of you are too young to remember, but America changed very drastically under President Reagan. And, and, and like it, it was a different landscape, and I, I was in a band called Black Flag, and we had a pretty big target on us. And we, we specifically timed one of our many tours that year to get out of LA during the Olympics, because there's like more cops than ever, and guys like us, we, we get we don't have a good time. And in that summer, I saw all these talented people who I knew: Booster Do, the Meat Puppets, the Minutemen, Sacred Trust, all these amazing bands who have talent like. They're like, there's no tomorrow talent. And between tours, they're all waiters and this and that. And they're, everyone's struggling. And I saw, because I'm, I'm the one in that group who doesn't have talent. And so I'm like, okay, if they have talent and I can see their ribs, what am I going to do? I better come up with plans B, C, D, E, F, and G to get through America, which turned into a survival environment for me. 
I'm not putting it down. I love the place. But it's a place you survive. It's a place you pass or fail in. And you can fall very hard. And so in the summer of 1984, I said, okay, more of those talking shows that I just started doing. I'm going to work even harder on my meager attempts to write. I'm going to take anything that comes my way. And if within a few years, voiceover stuff, hey, you want to be in a movie? Can you act? I'm like, yeah, can you give me lunch? I'll try any damn thing. <laughs> and uh, some of you live in L.A. or you've been there. It's like one building per four miles. If you don't have a car, you're done. I'm going to auditions like on three public buses and like power walking the next mile to show up completely covered in sweat to try and do a voiceover audition for Simba and the Lion King. <laughs> just had the guy go, <laughs> Get out. <laughs> and then you just turn face back to Silver Lake, like, oh. <laughs> just because you got to get some other things going. But I was lucky. Music did work out for me. It turned into a very full-time thing. But I was ready to do anything but go back to what I was doing before, which is, can I supersize that? May I park your car? Because that's the work I came, which I'm not putting down. But I came from 375 an hour minimum wage. And I didn't want to go back to it that fast. So I figured, I'll learn to do some other dance steps. So I said, hey, can you be in a film? You're like, yeah, I got, a, I got that beat. I'll try that. And so you go for a lot of auditions, and you make a fool of yourself, and you get you land some parts, and you get some confidence and some skill. And mainly, you just shut up and watch and listen and learn. I learned a lot of acting by just watching actors. I'd stay after and just watch, like, Al Pacino, I'm in the film with him. And like, he's acting, I'm not. I'm not. So I just sit and take a free acting lesson from Al Pacino, which is the worst thing in the world to do. Um, one thing we've talked about is um, you say you get, you get accused all the time of selling out. And, you know, um, there was a great rant you did on your show uh, a few years ago about that, about what the nature of sellout is. Mm. And it's like, I want to hear you talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, in the early days, Black Fly was an insanely ambitious band. We had our own label. We want to take over the world our own way and, and, and sell out stadiums. We just thought, like, we should just own the world with this music. Not so we can be rich and, and have big cars, just because we should just just rip this place apart. Music should just wreck it. And so we were very ambitious. We're making an album. Like, you guys made an album sold out. Well, what do you think of the first Clash album? I love that album. Okay, so they get to make a record. They're cool. Well, we made a record. We've sold out. You guys grew your hair. You sold out. I, one time we were in New Orleans and some guy gave us a paper bag of Mardi Gras beads, which did, Chuck Dukowski put around his neck, and anytime he'd see a girl at a show, he go, take this, my child, and give her like, some Mardi Gras beads, like they're hippie beads, and the girl, guy's like, girl's like, okay, thanks, go, like, whatever. And so like, what are you guys, hippies? We're like, yeah, we're hippies, and we just stopped cutting our hair in 82. I, I didn't cut my face, my beard. I had, you look at photos of me from 82, I had like, this stupid red streaked beard. And this bushy, bowl-cut hairdo. I didn't cut my hair again until 1986. And that was one long, extended, I'm a hippie? I, here's the hippie. Like, here it is. And like, telling me I sold out? I haven't had a meal in a day and a half. Shut up. I live in a van that smells of socks and the drummer. <laughs> you know, and who I cuddle up with, Bill Stevenson, my face buried in his neck acne every night. Spoon up, because there's no room. And like, that's your life. And so like, you so long. I slept in a Denny's parking lot last night until the cops kicked us out. <coughs> like, don't tell me I sold out. And so in later years, I'm, you know, voiceover guy and this and that. You sold out. I'm like, you don't get it, do you? It's the complete opposite. I'm an insurgent. This is punk rock. I got, I'm going into gate five of Warner Brothers today. I got a job in this place. Like, no one knows that I can't act. Don't you see? <laughs> this is the most amazing punk rock fraud I am perpetrating on a massive company. I'm perpetrating this fraud on a story. On one of so I'm, not, I'm still Henry from the ice cream store in my head. I'm still the 375 cent an hour guy, and I'm with people in suits at a table going, like, what am I doing here? But you have to put on, yeah, excellent, Bernie, great idea. And I'm just, I'm not faking it. I'm, I work hard, for real. But to me, it's complete insurgency. Anything I'm doing, I probably shouldn't be doing it except being on stage with a microphone. That I was kind of born to do. The rest of it, I'm just tiptoeing in, hoping not to get busted. So what, what about the stuff that you said no to? Ah, 